Let's dive right into it. And you know that we are your election command center. Anything politics, we are on top of it. And tomorrow we are all expecting some kind of a showdown. Maybe not what many of you expect. But let's go to parliament now. And the House is bracing itself for dramatic showdown as the MPP and the NDC clash over who holds the majority in parliament. With tensions mounting, all eyes are on what could be a defining moment in Ghana's democratic history. Noble Crosby Annan has more in this report. Ghana stands at the precipice of a constitutional crisis as the battle for parliamentary supremacy between the NPP and the NDC takes a dramatic twist. With the stakes higher than ever, both sides logged in at dead heat are preparing for a showdown and it's anyone's guess how this standoff will end. The spread of the chaos looms large, reminiscent of unprecedented scenes during the election of Speaker Alban Bagwing at the start of the 8th Parliament where fists flew in a chamber meant for debate. The flashpoint, Speaker Alban Bagwing's decision to declare four seats vacant shifting the balance of power to the NDC with a slim 136 to 135 majority. But the NPP leadership wasn't about to concede quietly, swiftly challenging the ruling in the Supreme Court. The court issued an ex parte order, freezing the Speaker's declaration and maintaining the status quo. As the clock ticks towards a defining moment, both sides remain entrenched the MPP caucus, led by a legend of Premier Markin, insists they remain the rightful majority. The rights of those MPs have been reinforced. This is the majority leader speaking. Government spokesperson on governance and security, Paul Grave, watching Dankwa, echoes the sentiment. What will take place on Tuesday is that the majority in parliament, led by the majority leader, the Honorable Afenio Markin, will lead the side of the house to sit at the majority side, whilst the minority, led by Atto Forsen, will sit at the minority side. On the opposing end, the NDC caucus remains defiant. For them, the Speaker's ruling is sacrosanct and they are the legitimate majority. The NDC now constitute the majority caucus in this eighth parliament. We will jealously protect our new majority status and will not bow retreat, nor surrender our lovely end status. Tensions are running high. An NDC chief with Kwame Abuja governs is not ruling out a repeat of the chaos that marred January 7, when a military invasion of parliament shocked the nation. Abuja governs vows such an intrusion would be fiercely resisted this time around. We are aware that between yesterday and today, government, some elements of government have had a meeting again to deploy the military to the precincts of parliament to enter the tent, the people of this country would react forcefully to any misconduct of anybody in uniform on Tuesday. So, what can we expect as parliament reconvenes on Tuesday? Will cooler heads prevail? Will the NDC relenting and returning to the minority side of the aisle? Or will Ghana's democracy be tested once again by a dramatic, perhaps violent confrontation on the floor? The question of who sits where hangs in the air. And with each passing moment, the odds of compromise seem to grow ever slimmer. One thing is certain, the entire nation will be watching what could be one of the most consequential days in Ghana's recent democratic history. Noble Crosby and TV3 News, Accra. Right, so let's uh, go straight to the House of Parliament now. The big day is tomorrow, but ahead of that, let's gauge the mood of what exactly is happening in Parliament as of this moment. Emmanuel Samani is my colleague who is in there for us. Emmanuel, uh, thank you for joining us. First of all, walk us through what you see now that you are in the dome of the conference centre where Parliament has been sitting in the last few uh, days. Well, good evening, Martin, and I'm currently in the dome where Parliament is set to convene tomorrow. And as we know, tensions are high, uh, you know, ahead of what is coming tomorrow, as the NDC have 
indicated that they picked up some intel that, you know, there might be some military personnel here and there, you know, but when I crisscrossed the, the dome area, I found no, uh, you know, military presence here at the moment. It's not even police officers, but when I got here a couple of minutes ago, we see that preparations are underway uh, for the set reconvening of parliament, which has indeed been set or confirmed for tomorrow. So I can tell you that, uh, let me just pan my camera briefly for you to uh, take a look yourself, just to see what it's looking like right now. Uh, we just had some people who just came in to, you know, sweep the place, dust it, and, you know, all is set for tomorrow's reconvening. So. Uh, there you have it, Martin. It's all mm. set for tomorrow's big day right here from the Dome. Right. So let's confirm two things that, first of all, on your way to Parliament or within the precincts of uh, the Dome or the Conference Centre, you did not see any military detachment there. However, what can you tell us about the security presence? Did you see anything like that over there as the minority, well, as the NDC is alleging? Well, Martin, so like I indicated earlier, coming into uh, the Accra International Conference Center, into the dome area, there was no sight of any military, not even police, which is usually the case around uh, the parliament enclave. But here, there's no signs or sight of police or military personnel okay. at the moment here at the dome. Right. Now, can you confirm to us if parliament has been served the judgment of the Supreme Court? Uh, which, you know, uh, was um, given last Friday. Absolutely. I can confirm that Parliament has received that uh, suit. But mm. as to whether the Speaker has received it, that uh, we cannot independently verify if the, the Speaker has actually received that suit. All right. And finally, Samani, we know that the majority sits on the right-hand side of the Speaker of Parliament and the minority on the opposite side. Um, when you got in and you checked, have there been any changes regarding the name tags on the tables on the majority side, which is the right side of the speaker? Well, Martin, I can tell you. So when I got in, one of the first things I did was to actually crisscross and see, look at the sitting arrangements. And I can tell you for sure that on the right side, according to the arrangements at the moment, this or on the right side is uh, the MPP's caucus. Uh, so, actually, on my right right now, I can show you the name tag of uh, Al-Hassan Lydia Seram, who is the MP for uh, Ayawaso West Wagon there. Mm -hmm. We also have uh, Anyimadu Enchi Kwame, as well as uh, Isiama Kwabana uh, Amankwa, who are all members of parliament for the NDC. And just, just to be sure, uh, you also have on the left side, uh, Ricketts Hagen, who is also the, M the NDC MP uh, for Cape Coast South. So uh, if things are the way they are at the moment, then mm. it would mean that uh, the MPP are supposedly the majority on the right side. And so that's what we're, we're seeing at the moment. We don't know if things will change because also we're hearing or picking indication that uh, some MPs would even come and sleep here and or, or come here in super early tomorrow and maybe make some you know uh, changes to the arrangement but right. at the moment mm. as of right now the mpp caucus is on the right while the the the, the ndc is on the left Emmanuel samani thank you for that report from the dome of the conference center where the um the members of parliament are expected tomorrow clearly it's a tale of two majorities it will be decided tomorrow when the speaker sits. Now, the opposition NDC is promising to repeal key tax handles like the e-levy with what it believes is its newly acquired majority status. This has sparked concerns about possible constitutional limitations which may make attainment of this feat impossible. Ghana's parliament in 2017 was constituted with the governing New Patriotic Party and Opposition National Democratic Congress tied at 137 seats. The NPP gained majority status through independent candidate Andrew Esiama, who opted to associate with the party. Speaker of Parliament Alban Babin has, however, declared four seats vacant, swinging control in favor of the NDC. This left the NDC with 136 seats, while the NPP had 135 seats.
The Supreme Court has since put this on hold, but the NDC is not backing down, promising to scrap taxes. In terms of forming quorum for parliamentary business, the party will have no issue as its number of 136 is more than the required minimum of one third of the members of parliament present. In terms of voting on issues, however, the party must have at least half of the members of parliament present. The constitution does not explain whether the members should be interpreted to mean the upper limit of parliament generally or how many current parliamentary seats are occupied. The NDC currently does not have enough numbers to form half of the 275, but have enough to form half of the 271 members if the four members are deemed to have vacated their seats. This is a view the NDC is proceeding with. 136 is the, the new majority, 135 is the new minority. The only chaos would be when our colleagues who are in the minority now refuse to accept that they are in the minority. All of you have confirmed that our colleagues have filed and they have crossed the line and they are in breach of Article 97, 1, uh, G and H. So that is not in, in, in question. That is why some people even query what some of the things that they claim came from the court, which I'm not, I'm not aware. So there's no problem about, about uh, fighting. Nobody is going to fight. You and I know where the majority sits in parliament. The majority sits where? On the right-hand side of the speaker. And then the minority sits on the, the left-hand side. Is that not the case? Let's get to the house and we shall see what will happen. It remains unclear whether the disagreement between the NDC MPs and their MPP counterparts will be resolved to avoid clear constitutional challenges up for discussion. Let's stay on this subject now and uh, engage former director of the Ghana School of Law, Kweku Ansa Asari. Uh, Mr. Ansa Asari, good evening. Thank you for your time. Right, so we uh, do have uh, Mr. Ansa Asari with us. And uh, Mr. Ansa Asari, if you can hear me, my first question would be, um, ahead of tomorrow, as a constitutional law lecturer yourself and someone who's followed this development very closely, many have shared the thought that we are in a constitutional conundrum based on what has happened. From where you sit, what are your expectations ahead of tomorrow? Well, thank you. My expectation ahead of tomorrow um, is one of some uh, slight ugliness, you know, in Parliament House. The usual parliamentary um, ugly noises. But uh, having said that, I also expect cool-headedness you know, uh, on the side of the leadership of both houses. And um, the, the way... Um, the political temperature is swinging, you know, uh, has been swinging since yesterday. I, I, I would suggest that uh, we do not leave the resolution of this compass to just uh, the leadership, you know, of uh, the House. I think we should go beyond that. This is the time that the Council of States uh, must be uh, up, you know, and doing. Uh, in accordance with the mandate uh, conferred on them by the 1992 Constitution. What? what? Uh, not the entire Council of State, but I, I, uh, I will suggest the chairman, then we have the former okay. Chief Justice uh, Leadership, uh, Georgina Theodora Wood. Um, we can also um, urge former President J. Kufo you know, to bring his wisdom to bear on what is happening. Mm. The incumbent president is a part of the problem and must therefore be a part of the solution. So um, the, the leadership, uh, the, the sitting president, two former presidents, John Ejekum Kufo, former president Mahama, mm. and uh, we can also invite and urge, you know, some... Um, uh, former speakers of parliament, all of them, together with the incumbent speaker of parliament and the leadership, must you know, try to judge just tomorrow to resolve this unnecessary you know, tension that has been created by an all predicting Supreme Court. We said this thing before that the current Supreme Court is you know, all too predictable. You know, and this is one instance that everybody predicted what we're going to do. Mm. And I don't like, you know, the way they go about five zero, seven zero, nine zero. Uh, at, at least we should have, you know, some, 
you know, dissenting uh, opinions on the voices. You right. Know, so tomorrow, tomorrow, uh, the whole nation, the whole nation, we should we should try to pray from tonight, mm. so that um, we 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 would we would not you know uh, see anything on towards. Right. Mr. Sassar, there are, I mean, so I get the point that you are saying, for instance, that elders in the country should speak up, former presidents, former, um, you know, uh, speakers of parliament, etc. People who hold significant position should speak up and try and resolve the issue. But why should they do that? We expect that of the 275 members of parliament who have all matured, supposedly, they should be able to sit and talk this through, shouldn't we? Should we not allow natural... Uh, flow of events in Parliament. It's as if we are all expecting them to fight and it's going to be, you know, quite a clash. Can we allow them to discuss with the Speaker there, debate how it's all go going to be? Because it's part of the democratic process, isn't it? Yeah, that is, that is why I started by asking who had it You see, but at, at this point, both, both sides are taking entrenched positions. You know, which is not uh, good for the nation. But it's other way for any uh, remediable steps to be taken. That is why you know we also need to have a plan B, and the plan B, you know, should um, be grounded in, 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 in the in the council of state membership. And, and I suggested the chairperson of the council of state, then a uh, former chief justice. Mm. But also, uh, former chief justice is a Kufu who can also you know, bring uh, a case where we have um, uh, uh, a Tukuba, that is a Tukuba, John Gute. Let all of them, yeah, let these people, you know, sit down and, and ask the leadership of parliament to show maturity. But in everything that they will do, they will need integrity. Right. Good conscience, good conscience, and above all, respect for you know each other's opinion. Okay. The, the taking and claim position will not you know help us in any way. We have to bear in mind that between now and December seven mm. is just a short time, seven okay. weeks, and we have to spend five out of the seven doing this. That is why. It would be better that all hands on deck. Don't okay. let us leave it you know, to them and expect reasonably that okay. you know, all will pass away. No. Okay. Then uh, there should be no attempt to invite the army to parliament. It is unnecessary. Okay. That, that, that will be adding you know, insult to injury. No attempt whatsoever. No attempt. Parliament is Parliament. They are All right, Mr. 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 we are grateful for your time this evening and thank you so much. Uh, apologies for cutting through, but uh, certainly tomorrow is pregnant. We'll see what would birth in Parliament tomorrow. And some personalities have been speaking on this development. Let me read some of their comments to you. And from Gabi Asario Chidako, a transactional lawyer, he says Parliament must by all means avoid a situation of seeming chaos and anarchy on Tuesday. I suggest the two leaders and the speaker meet before then to agree or to disagree on the next steps. Not long to December 7, let maturity be our guide and guard. From the leader of the NPP caucus in Parliament, Alexander Venumark, and he says, I can assure of that we won't, there won't be any showdown or whatever tomorrow. We are law-abiding people and we, won't, we, want, we want the laxity for violence. Should they take over our seats or do anything that is untoward, I will lead a walkout. From Kezo Latufos, leader of the NDC caucus in parliament, he says, we will jealously protect our new majority status and will not bow, retreat, or surrender our lawfully earned status. And from the speaker of parliament, he says, God bless our homeland Ghana and make it great and strong beyond any single individual or institution. And ahead of the big day in Parliament, we have been speaking to some Ghanaians on what they expect from the MPs and how they should conduct themselves. I am expecting both sides, especially MPP, eh, to exercise 
um, restraint, we should call speed the speed. The Speaker of Parliament has already ruled because the Parliament are the legislators. They draft the law to be passed by the Supreme Court. So in this case, the Supreme Court has erred. They have erred. They should understand that. You see, they are overstepping their limit. This same issue some time ago we heard, we saw uh, the former Speaker of Parliament, my, Professor Michael Quay, he ruled on this case and vacated the seat, make the seat vacant. The NDC didn't object to that. It's actually a dicey situation and it's also a history in the making. So uh, I hope uh, whatever the, the Speaker has declared, uh, she will stay on so that at least that will be a history. All right, so it's just a few um, hours away. Here at your election command center, we'll be bringing you proceedings in parliament actually when it does start in the morning, through the morning show, up until uh, we see what logical conclusion will be arrived at in parliament. Away from that, barely 24 hours after he was reported to have been assaulted while in police custody, Democracy Hub convener Oliver Baka Vomao has been released. The activist in the company of family and other protesters at the Accra High Court met his bail conditions. Lord Edouard observed the development and reports. There have been contrasting reports from the police and the democracy hub regarding what transpired while convener Oliver Bakavomawo remained in police custody. A friend of the accused who visited him in custody narrated that the activist was assaulted by eight police officers before he was transferred to another station. But the police in a counter statement debunked the allegations, indicating that Oliver sustained minor scratches on his hand during a scaffold to get him cuffed before his transfer. They further noted that the transfer was necessitated because he was allegedly planning to compromise the security of other inmates. In court on Monday, the Democracy Hub convener was finally released after meeting his 20,000 CD bill with two sureties. An emotional Bakavomao spoke to the media. We would need you in the past, in the past ahead. And I'm certain that in the ways in which you have responded to the call, in the ways in which your voices have kept me alive and also uh, made sure that the, those who have gone through this tragedy for our republic will not be forgotten. I am certain that when we call on you again, you show up. Because that's who we are as Ghanaians. We show up for each other. And that even those who continue to appeal to the worst parts of us, we continue to show them the better angels that are within us. His mother, Benes Kumwaji, said she's had sleepless nights since she heard about Oliver's predicament. I thank God that my son has been released for me today. No woman would be happy if their child is facing difficulties. What he did was not a bad thing. He was just being a good citizen of Ghana. I am not able to sleep when I go to bed. Let's now go to the labor front where more than 27,000 public service workers have embarked on an indefinite strike over government refusal to pay their respective institution specific allowances. The workers maintain the denial of this allowance is financially constraining them. 45 state institutions migrated onto the single spine pay policy have embarked on an industrial action following the inability of government to pay them institution specific allowance. The striking institutions, which include the Electoral Commission, National Commission for Civic Education, the Ghana Meteorological Services Department, Ghana Broadcasting Corporation, Ghana News Agency, Ghana Revenue Authority, Ghana Standard Authority, Ghana AIDS Commission, Ghana Airports Company, and Audit Service of Ghana are demanding the allowance in two folds, Government Support Services Allowance, and Public Services Administration and Equity Allowance. Series of engagement by the union leadership with the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission, acting as government negotiator, did not yield the expected results. On Monday, the news team visited some of the striking institutions. 
As the country's election management body, the Electoral Commission, the strike took full effect as all supporting staff and senior members of the union at the commission stayed away from work. Private security guards and janitors were, however, the major workforce on the premises at the time of the new team's visits. Members of the public who walked in to engage the commission were turned away. The security at the premises is secured. The effect of the strike is also felt at the Ghana News Agency. The Ghana News Agency has two unions, the Public Services Workers Union and the Communication Workers Union. The Communication Workers Union held the force of the organization, while their colleagues in the PSWU strike to demand their allowance. The situation is no different at the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation, GBC. Here, journalists in the radio and TV newsrooms were present, but staff in other departments were absent. The leadership of the union is resolute in its decision, despite calls from some government officials on Monday to call off the strike. But the union insists not backing down on its demands until government meets the demands of the members. Every two years you ask for review if you have received some. And where you have not received some, you are also asking for the new allowance. You're still watching News 360 on TV3. Stay with us. We have many more stories for you after the break. Welcome back. Let's do business news now. The Institute of Economic Affairs, IEA, has vehemently opposed the proposed sale of the Achim Gold Mine project in Ghana by Newmont Company to China's Zijing Comp Mining Group. The IEA argues that the deal is riddled with flaws detrimental to Ghana's interests and unacceptable. The IEA contends that the lease for the Achim Gold Mine project remains valid until January 2025 and in a transfer of ownership requires the approval of the Ghanaian government. The institute also criticizes the terms of the original lease agreement, stating that it is heavily biased in favor of Newmont and offers little benefit to Ghana. The IEA notes that several Ghanaian entities bid for the mine, but were allegedly outbid by Zijin. The institute further argues that the proposed sale would significantly undervalue the Achim Gold Mine as the annual average yields are estimated to be substantially higher than the proposed sale price. Using the reported annual average production of 11.4 tons of gold, equivalent to 402,123 ounces, and an average world market price of $2,600 per ounce, the IEA projects annual average yields of $1.05 billion. This amount would accrue to prospective Ghanaian owners and the country annually, allowing Zijin to acquire the mine for $1 billion, which would benefit Newmont, while Zijin would presumably only pay royalties and taxes to Ghana, would significantly shortchange the country. According to the IEA, the deal is not in the economic best interest of the country and should be rejected. Finally, the IEA proposes amendments to the Constitution and Minerals and Mining Act to enhance the governance of the country's natural resources and reduce corruption. Now, the Coffee Federation of Ghana is urging cocoa farmers, especially those farming around mountainous areas across the country, to adopt coffee production, leveraging the conducive climate conditions of such areas. Vice President, Coffee Federation of Ghana, Samuel Adimado, uh, believes that coffee has the same potential as cocoa if given the needed attention. The coffee industry is set for significant expansion with a projected annual growth rate of 4.47% between 2023 and 2025, potentially exceeding $540 billion. This growth is driven by the global rise in coffee popularity influenced by increased consumption in emerging markets and shifting consumer preferences. Vice President of the Coffee Federation of Ghana, Samo Adimado, emphasizes the vast opportunities for Ghanaians in this thriving industry. The potential for coffee production is almost the same as the potential for cocoa. One advantage we have is that the variety of coffee we have in this part of our world is robusta. That comes with a very strong coffee flavor, high level of caffeine, and all these characteristics makes it very convincing, let me put it. 
to look at it as an opportunity for growth of coffee production because there is a market for it. Coffee Processor outlined several initiatives aimed at promoting local consumption and increasing demand. So I have this which is two Ghana cities. It's literally just coffee, but it's packaged in a, a steep bag. So you place it in hot water and then you can have it single use and uh, you're gone. Uh, we also have a partnership with the Ghana Cocoa Board uh, for an indigenous marketing initiative. Uh, majorly, we're looking at uh, fuel stations. Um, as there's a growing uh, taste for coffee in Ghana as well, if you want to produce it, be my guest.